Bruins, Hurricanes, Bruins up two games to one. Evan Marinovsky, let's talk a little bit about what we saw in game three, how it's going to impact game four going forward. And obviously, we spent a lot of time on Tuka Rask and the big story heading into the game. Big story during the game was Yaroslav Halak was freaking dynamite, minus that one complete brain cramp. But that's not even – not everything he saw, he stopped. He was great. Uh, great comments from Bruce Cassidy about how – they like him a lot in the locker room. They rallied around him. We've always considered this a one and one a situation, but let's be real. How big a drop off is there here in talent? We're talking about a Vezina trophy finalist and one of the best goaltenders in all of hockey with a playoff pedigree and Yaro Halak, who of course has some playoff success of his own and is a, the best backup or one of the best backups in the league. But w- what kind of shape are the Bruins in with Halak and who knows what the rest of the way? So this is the thing with Halak. Um, Halak is probably the best backup goalie in hockey. I mean, to me, Halak is one of the best, if not the best. Uh, He is someone who you can absolutely rely on. I think the talent drop-off is obviously pretty big just because it's Tuka Rask, not because Halak is bad per se. It's more because Rask is so high up there. Um, I do think looking at them in game three and the way the adversity they're facing and how they're using this right. and how, you know, Marshawn stood up on the bench after Halak's boneheaded play and said, this isn't going to affect us. I think they're rallying around Halak on a different level. Sure. I think they're looking at Halak and saying, you know what, we're going to win it for him. You know, this guy's going to get thrown in there. He got told like <laughs> an hour before the game that he was going right. to start. We're going to do this for him. And I think this kind of re-energizes the Bruins. I do think that the team was kind of thrown off by Rask's comments after game two of that it felt like an exhibition game because I do think they looked at it and said, wait a second, we're out here. It's, in, it's playoff hockey. Sweeney even said that um, before game three. So I do think, you know, the talent drop up is there. But I think the will to play for Halak is just on a different level right now, given what they faced earlier this morning. So this is what we can't know, okay? Uh, so Tuca's gone, and Don Sweeney said he kind of saw it coming. You have to imagine if Sweeney saw something coming, the Bruins' teammates might have gotten a f- vibe. And again, there's a lot of speculation here, but we're trying to read between the lines. You have to imagine that the Bruins uh, had a vibe, especially with those comments, ah! He's having a tough time getting motivated for this. And again, we chalked it up to him just being honest and direct and saying what's on his mind. And I don't know whether it truly affected his performance, but again, the vibe it gives off is, does this guy give a shit? You know? And again, I don't know. Maybe not. Maybe everyone's Tuca being Tuca. But you do get a sense that, and again, I think people at home should look at it as not Tuca Rask versus Yaro Halak. It's 80% of Tuca Rask or Tuca Rask without his head really into it versus a full Yaro Halak doing everything that he can and his teammates rallying around him. And at which case the level might not be as uh, dramatically different as we think. Because, again, we don't know. Tuca might have had, you know, 50% of his brain back home thinking, I don't know, man, and just not, not there. You know, I mean, his numbers through a couple of games weren't terrific, um, but he wasn't horrible. But, again, that's what you had. The reality is Tuca Rast didn't – it felt like he either didn't want or could not be with the team and give his full attention to hockey considering what was going on back home. And so again, that's, that's the reality of what you have is a fully engaged Yaro Holak, who honestly I would argue is better than both of the hurricane starting goaltenders. Well, so that's the thing. A fully invest, you, you hit it. A fully invested Halak is better than a halfway invested to sure. Rask. And I think that goes for most backup goal, uh, backup starter scenarios. Now you also mentioned the hurricanes goaltending situation. You have Mrazek and Reimer. Mrazek's yeah. been in for games one and three, lost both of them after he did play very good. He played very well in game three. I, I don't, yeah. you know, he, the hurricanes did him no favors. He right. played really, really well, let in a power play goal and let in that shorthanded goal. Hard to fault him for either of those. Uh, But Reimer was the lone winner. I mean, he won it in game two. Yeah. You know, played pretty well. That was the Bruins' worst game. So I will give Mrazek a pass on that. Uh, But the Hurricanes – and this, again, this goes back to last year. You know, the Hurricanes are a team – uh, that has a has real problems in net because they don't have a set starter. That's why the the idea of the two goalie tandem is awesome, but there needs to be a considerable enough difference yeah, yeah. between one and two yeah. that you can make a starter for the playoffs. The Hurricanes had the same problem last year. They had Mrazek and McElhaney, and McElhaney went in for I believe games three and four. Yeah. Um, Mrazek was only games one and two. It's the same thing this year, except the performances are much better. But they still don't have a grasp because Mrazek and Reimer are too close in talent. 
to pick one. And Rob Brennamore is facing that challenge right now. And that's the cliche. If you don't have one set starter, you have none. You have none. <laughs> you have none. And, and it is what it is. So now you've got a lot of guesswork there because, right, you, you may view if the, the eye test. If you think Mrazek is slightly higher as the one, uh, you know, which is why you give him the game one nod, which is why you bring him back for game three after game two win. That has to tell you uh, that br that's who Brenda Moore wants to be the guy. But now you got to get second guess yourself and say, well, two losses, one win kind of played well in three. Do I come back? Do I go to the other? If I go back to this guy, he gets shelled in game four. Is that on me? And you start to second guess yourself. So you're almost always in the middle of some sort of goalie controversy, even in your own mind, let alone you know, who your teammates think, who the teammates think should be out there, who the fans think should be out there. So it's this thing that doesn't go away for them. We'll see what decision he makes there. Um, they will obviously going to be shorthanded now where the Bruins have been without David Pasternak and were able to survive game three. Uh, you're without Andrei Svechnikov. It looks like possibly forever. I don't know the full details, but that looked like a bad, bad. That was gruesome situation there. He was in obvious pain. And um, I don't, I, again, we're speculating at this point, but you can't see him returning. No, I don't. And I, the way that injury was the way that he had to be carried off that's not something that's a bruise. That's not a sprain. That's not something that, you know, can just get some dirt rubbed on it. Yeah. That is not, you cannot use that leg now, at least from what I saw. You know, I mean, I looked at that play and that stinks because Svechnikov is one of the great young up and coming talents in the NHL. And I mean, he's an absolute joy to watch. I mean, he's, yeah. he's just so talented. He's quick. He's fast. He's this yeah. new NHL type player. You're worried about him when he's out there, you know? Exactly. He's you're, someone you have, you have to, to account for You have him. to game plan around. Yeah, you have to exactly. game plan around Andrei Svechnikov. I also think the people saying it's Char's fault are idiots. Because oh, Chara on. just gained possession, gained position on him. I don't think it's Char's fault. That's yeah. a freak accident. You know, Chara's leg wasn't even around that leg. It was the other leg. That, it was his right leg, I believe, that Svechnikov fell awkwardly on. Um, but that is a huge loss for the Hurricanes. I mean, now you are without a lethal score, a lethal offensive yeah. production guy um, for the, you know, and you're down two to one in the series. For so an definitely, offensively challenged team. Yeah. For an offensively challenged team, this is not an ideal position for the Carolina Hurricanes. No, no. And so, uh, you know, uh, conversely, the, the Bruins may get back their top scorer in Pasternak, who we, we, we kind of assumed this was going to be a stretch for him to play in game three with the short turnaround, the game being at noon, um, but now you've got a couple of days, a lot of, a lot of time, you know, I mean, all of Saturday, all of Sunday, all of Monday with the game being Monday night, that that's, it's Monday night, correct? It is Monday night. Monday night, sorry. Correct. So that's, now we've got like two and a half days to hopefully, and then practice, you have a morning skate, go through proper routines. There's no morning skate for game three. The, the, and to really test it and really see where you are and get a good idea if you're going to be able to play. Again, you have a little cushion being up 2-1, but not much. If it were a 3-0 series, we might be talking about, hey, maybe you sit him one more. But it's really nice to get him back, particularly what we saw um, with, again, we like Anders Bjork. We think there's something there. But he was, at best, invisible. At worst, a train wreck um, in his time there, taking a couple of penalties in Game 3. He did get dropped a little bit. Um, you know, on a shift or two, but I, that's, I don't know that he's the answer. Uh, and, and if no pasta, where, where do you go on that first line? Well, so just on Bjork real quick, I mean, you know, the Bruins have all that momentum at the beginning of the third period, they score a, a shorthanded goal and Bjork takes a dumb tripping penalty in the offensive zone. In the it's offensive just, zone. It's just, yeah. it's, you don't, you can't do that. You can not do that. It was a blatant trip. Um, you can't do that. And Cassidy has no problem taking a young guy and telling him to sit on the back of the bench. And that's what he did with Bjork. Um, yeah. As for what they should do, again, we said this after game two, there's not a lot of options for what they can do. Um, you had Bjork that didn't really seem to click well. I mean, he was, he could be a placeholder for a few shifts, but not a full game. The interesting one, Stadnika. Stadnika looked really, really good sure. in game three. And with he Coyle, did. he fit really well, especially great. with Corrali on the left side. He looked great. The, uh, you know, the advanced stats support it. The eye test supported it. Now, do you want to break up that third line to then put Stadnika with two really capable offensive guys? Now, my opinion on that is give it, give it a few shifts. You know, try it for a few shifts in game four. You don't have to set it the whole game. Try it for a few shifts, see how it goes, and ride with it. Yeah. Uh, that is what they should do with Stanika. Try him on that first line. They do it in practice all the time. Yeah. Do it in a game. Let's see what it looks like in a playoff setting against the Hurricanes in game four. Because 
you know, you can put Bjork up there, you can put Coleman, but those guys are not going to actually produce. They will create chances. They will get the puck in deep. They'll, you know, they might be able to cycle it well, but they're not going to set up the high danger chances. And they're also not going to be able to finish at the level someone like Stadnika would be able to. So to me, Stadnika is the, is the guy you try. You also have a cushion in this series. It's two to one. So just go ahead and try it. You know, yeah. the kid's got the potential. The kid's going probably going to be elite someday. The, the organization's high on him. Give it a shot. It's like McAvoy in 2017 against the Senators. Throwing him in there and seeing how it worked. It played great back then. Sadika has been pretty good to great every time he's been in the lineup during this bubble I, time. I, I like Give it, it a shot. I like it. I, I, and, I, and I would like to see it. But again, we're not sure, uh, you know, based on. You know. Yeah, he could. Pasta could be back, and we could just yeah. never have to have this conversation uh, unless it's a nagging injury, which we discussed as well. And ultimately, let's 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 play the hypothetical here uh, before we wrap it up. Let's say it's close, but he's iffy. Uh, do you roll the dice? Do you, do you play him because you need him, or do you say, "Eh, let's go one more"? Again, this is the tough decision with 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 you know potentially nagging injuries. Is how ready is ready? Is it, you know, it's injured versus hurt. Is he still going to be, is he going to be a hundred percent? Could he gain, could he benefit from a little bit more time off? It's, it's that game you play. I mean, you're not trying to get out of the first round here. You're trying to win a Stanley cup with this team, you know, so there you have to leverage the long-term, uh, you know, uh, you know, the, the long-term vision here. This is, they, they need him to make a deep run. Short-term pain for long-term gain. That, yeah. is the, that is the perfect thing for it. What's funny to me is it feels like the Bruins were iffy on him going into game three. I think no was, the, the way Cassidy was talking about it, it almost sounded like if the game was later on, if it was at 8 p.m. on Saturday, they would have played him. Yeah. So I do think it's gonna, it will be close. iffy. But if we're going to play the hypothetical game and say that if he is iffy going to game four, you're up to one. I do say you, you don't play him. Now, here's the thing. The Bruins have not scored a five-on-five five goal since game one. The five-on-five the, right. five at the empty net was just – it was an empty net. I don't yeah. – whatever. It was a great pass by Krejci, but yeah. I'm not going to go ahead and count that as like a five-on-five five goal per se. Yeah. But, you know, they scored on the power play and shorthanded in game three. Game two was two power play goals. The power play is looking great. Five-on-five five scoring is not. So you do want Pasternak back, but you want him healthy. And if you're up to one in a series like this – I say leave him out. Maybe. Let him let him recover from that nagging injury because you don't want him to re-aggravate it. Uh, you do want to give him the extra rest. So if we're going to play the hypothetical game, which I always love playing, uh, if they do that, if they do that, if he is if he going to the game four, I do think you rest him one more game. Okay. Well, we'll see. We've got a couple of days, full Saturday, all of Sunday, and all of Monday to kind of see where we are with that. There'll be coverage throughout, though, so keep it here. Uh, the YouTube channel here, Evan Marinovsky has the Bruins covered. We'll have uh, tomorrow's practice, uh, more stuff leading up to game four. And obviously we'll be here right after game four to break it all down for you. So for Evan Marinovsky, I'm John Zanis. We'll catch you guys later.